Let's begin. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw, she looked upon him and said, Of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew at the midst, and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after that, surely. Thou art one of them, for you are a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he began to what? Curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom you speak. And the second time, the cock crew, and Peter called to them, that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crew twice, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. That's the last line I'm focusing on heavily. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Subject matter is entitled, It's the Thought That Counts. Let us pray. Father, I can't do this alone. So please, be with me. And be with us, even as we hear your voice, in the name of Jesus Christ. The incident that is before us was occasioned by a story, well, not a, so much of a story. Jesus, you know, was with his disciples during the Last Supper. And I'm sure with heaviness in his heart, he said, all of you, shall run away and leave me and peter and i believe he was very sincere when he said it so lord you see these guys if all of them offend you i i am i got your back i'm going to be there with you and jesus looked at him understanding the sincerity of his heart but knowing the frailty of his mind and his experience told him peter before long you will not deny me once or twice, but three times. I've looked at the story and this particular verse, and he thought thereon and wept bitterly, gripped my attention. Because I would want to believe that all of us at some point in our experience is the Peter that we find here today. We really meant what we said when we made that vow to the Lord before this communion, I'm going to be right. I'm going to do it right this time. And God knew that we were sincere. But he also remembered what his prophet Jeremiah said, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The implication is, you don't even know yourself. I know you better than you think and better than you know yourself. So let him that thinketh he stand. Take heed lest he fall. But God, Jesus right there, did not want Peter to fall. Because remember in the garden when he asked them to pray for him, if Peter had listened to Jesus in the garden, he would not have experienced what he did here in the hall. He fell asleep. He went to sleep with the rest of the disciples and Christ was asking for him or for them to pray for him. But notice Peter came alive with, when the time came and they were about to take Christ, he was alive and he pulled his sword and mistakenly cut off the ear of one of the soldiers whose name is Malchus, I believe. I say mistakenly because if I think I know Peter well, Peter was not aiming for his ear. He missed his target and got the ear. 
Let's be real. If you have a sword, you won't aim it at anybody's ear. But the guy must have ducked or tried to get out of the way and Peter caught his ear. But the point I want to make is that Peter could fight physically but not spiritually. And sometimes we get involved in physical battles because we fail to win the spiritual battle. Am I talking to anybody here today? If Peter had been praying, he would know that God's battles are not won or fought by swords, by physical armory. The enemy will want the church of the living God to get involved in physical squabbles. Because when we do that, we lose sight of an even deeper battle that enrages. Sometimes it's not the battle between you and your brother that you have to be mindful of. Sometimes the greatest battle is between you and you. To win that battle over you. That's the battle that Peter failed to win in the hallway as he sat there. A young girl came by and, and said, wait, wait a minute, you are one of them. Peter was being accused of being one of them. And here is a place and a time when an accusation was confirmation of conversion. <laughs> you didn't hear what I just said. The accusation was good news. Mm -hmm. It was evidence that Peter had been converted. Because Peter was not always as Jesus would have him to be. He was a fisherman before he met the Lord. But three years with Jesus changed him. And he was not able to conceal the change that Jesus had brought upon his life. Because it's difficult to be with Jesus and conceal it. Not only those who know of it can say amen. It's difficult to spend time with him and conceal your experience. You might even keep quiet. But even in your silence, you will expose who you are. Peter didn't say anything the first time around when she came around. She just looked at him and somehow his countenance was glowing with a radiance that told her she, he was with Jesus. And while Peter should have been ecstatic, he said, what you're talking about? Look, woman, I don't know what you're saying. I don't understand what you're saying. She came back again and said, no. And another woman called, yes, I saw him. I saw him on the mount. I saw him there when he was feeding 5,000. I was a part of the multitude. I know it is he. And Peter started to deny it the third time. And this is the part I want to get to before we close. The third time the Bible says Peter began to swear and to curse. I saw, and imagine for him to do that, he must have been filled with anger. Because after he had done that, they said, oh, your Galilean speech betrays you. I want to spend a little time with that because you know many of us we change our accent depending on which country we go to oh lord have mercy all of a sudden we know how to uh, drop the accent hey man how are you doing oh, because we want others to feel that hey we have been around we somehow get the fresh water affecting our accent but i've learned brothers and sisters one of the best ways to know the nationality of an individual is to get him angry. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. You might speak the Queen's English now, but wait till you get angry. I remember talking to an elder of a particular church, and man, he was versatile with the Queen's English. One day he wanted me to do something which I refused to do, and because I was a young boy that time, and he was way past my senior he was upset with me and all of a sudden he forgot how the queen spoke and the twang came out it betrayed him i said lord have mercy this is the person that i know because many of us we put on until we got ups get upset so Peter started to swear and to curse, but wait a minute, many times, and even I have run the risk of misunderstanding what transpired here when he started to swear. It's not so much that he was using obscenities. That's reading the text through Western lenses, because the word swear and curse comes across as if he was using obscenities. 
put in local parlance, he was cussing. That's not what the text really was saying. The first word, swear, has to do with an oath. I make an oath that I am not one of them. It reminds me of the time when we were growing up, and you know, whenever we want to stand by a word, we said, mm, 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 cross my heart and hope to die. You remember that? Remember those experiences? That's what he was actually doing. He was saying, no way I am part of that clan. I have never met that man in my life. But the next word is more, even more interesting because literally it means to seven one's self. S-E-V-E-N. To seven. Why seven? Because whenever somebody wanted to declare that what he is saying is true, he would do something seven times. Or he would do seven different things. Or he would say seven different things just for you to know that I am not of it. So he began to swear and to curse and he was severing himself. He kept saying, no, I'm not. And I don't know what exactly he did, but in so doing, he exposed himself. I could see the men standing by listening to him, severing himself. And saying all manner of things that will convince them as he was trying to convince himself that he was not one of them. And they stood up looking at him. I could see them bouncing. Mm -hmm. He's one of them. And he was saying, I'm not one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The more he spoke, is the more, you better shut up, brother. The more he spoke, is the more he exposed himself. Yeah. He is one of them and according to the record when he was severing himself when he was cursing and swearing he could have seen the back of Jesus right in the hallway so he did it in the presence of Jesus oh how many times have we done that in the presence of Jesus in fact in order to do something wrong you have to deny who you are Come on, talk to me, somebody. If you are a Christian and you get caught up in evil, at the time you're getting caught up in evil, you are denying who you are. You at that moment say, I am not what I say I am, so that you can get away with doing what you want to do. That's how we deny ourselves. And Jesus came and the Bible says in another record that Jesus just looked at him. And many times, many times, we have examined this episode by looking at Peter. But I want to spend a little time looking at Jesus. Because my mind was, was, was wondering as to what was in the heart of Jesus when he looked at Peter. Was he saying, I told you so? I doubt it very much. I suppose Jesus, who wanted support at the time, he looked pitifully at Peter why didn't you stand up for me? Because you've got to remember, Jesus is flesh and blood like we are. And sometimes he needs the prayers of those he loves. Sometimes he needs our support. And when we run off and do the wrong thing, he stands there looking at us. He does not condemn us, but I can feel that he is disappointed. You had a grand opportunity to let these scoundrels know who you are and who I am. Jesus just looked at him. And the Bible says, Peter began to think. And then he wept bitterly. It's the thought that counts. Because many times we don't turn away from evil because we don't think of what we have done. We don't see how it is, has impacted our own life. There are three things I want to leave with you very briefly. We don't have much time. The first thing Jesus, Peter must have thought about was the fact that he had promised fidelity to Jesus. I said I won't fall. And now I did. The second thing he must have thought about is that though I promised fidelity, I still fell. And the third thing he would have thought about was the face of Jesus I presumed to be faithful to him but I fell and looked at his face and I'm saying you won't turn around from evil I won't turn around from evil until I think about the face of Jesus and what it has done for me 
I don't know about you, but I believe every time a cock started to crow after that incident, Peter was gripped with guilt. And I want to explain to you that there was a ministry in the cock crowing. Mm -hmm. Come on, talk to somebody. There was a ministry in the cock crowing. It was a reminder that what Jesus said is right. It affected his heart whenever when he heard the second time this cock crowing, it gripped his heart and sometimes God has a way of ministering to us that we could never imagine. It might not be a cock crowing. It might be a child pleading. It might be a death in the family. It might be an accident. It might be some other incident. But Jesus uses anything to remind us of what he has said to us. But before I close this, I must tell you one thing that I learned from Peter's experience. Help me, Jesus. I think Jesus would want us to know if Peter fell, it means that not because you are favored means you too would not fall. Are you still here with me? <laughs> he wants us to know that the best of men is at best men. Let me say that again. The best of men is at best men. I don't care what garb you wear. I don't care what office you hold. I'm not sure if you have been here for 50 years, but you are still man. Jesus wants us to know that even the best of us can fall. That's why his grace <laughs> is sufficient <laughs> for all of us. Could somebody say amen? That's why his grace is sufficient for us to remind us that though you fall i can pick you up again he told peter satan wants to sift you as wheat but i have seen that you will fall that's why i have prayed for you peter that when you are converted that means when you get back up you can tell all other ministers that though they may fall his grace is sufficient for us it was in 18th century london robert Robinson was joining a group of individuals on their way to church. He had been away from church for a long time, converted by the exotic preacher and preaching of one by the name of George Whitfield. But you know how it goes. He wandered away from God. Even though he had written a song or at least written a poem about his own experience before he came to the Lord, though he was in church for a long time, he still, like Peter, wandered away. Joining this summer group on the way to church, a, car a car carriage stopped by, and he was about to jump in when he realized it was a woman who was in the carriage. And because women back then were not treated with respect, he told her, he waved her to go ahead, but she insisted that she wants to speak with him. So, are you going to church? She said hesitatingly, yes. And he jumped onto the carriage and they exchanged introductions to each other. Then she recalled that there is something about this name, Robert Robinson, uh, that sort of startled her memory. She said, wait a minute. She went into her purse and she pulled out a poem in one of her notebooks and began to read the words of that poem. Come thou found of every blessing tune my heart to sing thy praise streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of wondrous praise he took the notebook away from her and began reading because he had forgotten the words he rehearsed them and he, he revisited them and while she kept talking to him and she said to him imagine i am sitting down next to the author of these words and while she was ecstatic tears came to his eyes especially when he came upon the words prone to wonder 
Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave. God above. That gripped his heart and he began to cry. Now realizing that what he had written three years before now came to pass again. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. And I want to declare to you, each one of us is prone to wonder. And we don't have to leave the confines of a building. We can wander right in church. Prone to wander. If you look back over the time you got baptized to the point where you are now, you can admit, some of you at least, that you wandered from that experience you once had. Why? Because we are prone to wander. She kept talking to him and he kept saying, this is me prone to wonder lord i feel it but he said she said to him that's not all you wrote read lower down take my heart take and seal it seal it for thy courts above you ended on a positive note so even though you're prone to wonder he can take your wandering heart and seal it for thy courts above I don't know who is wondering today. But Peter thought on what the Lord told him in private. And he cried. Everybody who would have seen him crying then would not have understood why he was crying. Has there not been an experience in your life where tears came to your eyes but nobody around you knew why? Because you remembered what the Lord told you in private. I still love you. I still love you. You remember his face that morning. You remember his, his eyes. You remember his words. And you're saying, Lord, I'm sorry for what you have done. For what I've done. Because, Lord, I knew better. Maybe that's you right now. As you reflect on something you did, tears came to your eye and nobody understood. Because there are some tears that only Jesus can understand. Am I talking to anybody here? There are some tears. You can't even tell your loved ones because it's between you and Jesus. But he wept because he thought of what he did. My appeal to you this morning is start thinking of the things that you do. And if you think hard again, Jesus can make a change in your life because it's the thought that comes. Let us pray. Father, this is not the all exciting message that we may want to hear, but it's perhaps the right message that somebody needs to hear. Because we are wandering far from you. We are going through the rituals every week. And oh Lord, oh how sorry we are today. Maybe right now somebody is trying to hold back the tears. Because as you think of that thing you did, you can't feel good about who you are. But I'm telling you today and I'm reminding you that Jesus does not condemn you. He was careful to mention Peter's name when he came out from the grave. To remind Peter, I have not forgotten you. Yes, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But Lord, take my heart, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. It's deceitful above all things, but take it. It's desperately wicked, but take it. I think I stand when I will fall, but take it and seal it, Lord. For thy courts above and I shall stand only when you are standing with me I am thankful that you are here with me and when I leave your courts today let me continue to meditate more upon you why because it's the thought that comes in my Christian experience this being my prayer in Jesus' name.